There's a saying which goes, if you think you're leading and you turn around and look behind you and nobody's following you, well, folks, you're just going for a walk. <laughs> so we tend to pay a lot of attention to leadership. And I'd like to, rather than talk about leadership this afternoon, I'd like to talk about what I call followership. To think about what followership is and why it's important right now, why the world needs great followers, some of the impact that followership can have, some of the characteristics of great followers, and finally I'd like to leave you with a couple of questions to go away with as we close this afternoon. So here's the first question. Can you think of a great follower? What are they like? Well, while you're pondering on that question, let me take you back to 1953. Now, I know most of us were never, never alive or weren't alive in 1953, but it was a big year. It was a big year for New Zealand. It was a huge year in the field of mountaineering. It was actually the year that Queen Elizabeth II was crowned as well. So 1953, if you think back, was a pivotal year. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. Has anybody heard of John Hunt? Great, okay, just a few. Has anybody not heard of Sir Edmund Hillary? It's always a relief when no hands go up there. So the interesting thing was that, as you probably remember, 1953 was the year that Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay Sherpa summited Mount Everest. So for the first time, an expedition had put two people on top of Mount Everest and, more importantly, had come back safely. And this was huge news around the world, um, celebrated in New Zealand, celebrated in the UK, because it, it was actually a British expedition. Uh, but the interesting thing was, most people kind of thought Ed Hillary was the leader of the expedition. He was the guy who went to the summit. But that wasn't the case. John Hunt, the guy that so few of us have heard of, was actually the leader of that expedition. And the thing that interests me about him, I met him once, it was a great privilege, is that he chose, rather than taking an out-the-front leadership role where he put himself in the limelight and drew plaudits and accolades for leading the expedition that put the first people on the top of Mount Everest, he didn't do that at all. He chose to be a follower. He chose to enable those people to get to the top of the mountain and he demonstrated what I believe is one of the fundamental prerequisites of followership, and that is great humility. So, I've been working with leaders for probably 30 years now. Young people on expeditions, senior leaders in boardrooms, all sorts of organizations around the world. And what's interesting to me is that leaders may be the catalyst they may be the architects of change. They may be the visionaries. But you know what? It's followers who get things done. It's followers who make things happen. So I'd like you to come on a, a short journey with me, a journey of exploration, if you like, as I started to explore this idea of followership, which has intrigued me more and more over time. So I'm going to go back to when I was 11 years old. I was at boarding school in England, and I was a chorister. I was a cathedral chorister. And it was a pretty privileged position to be in. I'd got a choral scholarship to Winchester Cathedral, so one of the largest, most prestigious cathedrals in Europe. And this was significant to me because my dad had also been a chorister, different cathedral. He'd also been head chorister at a place called Litchfield Cathedral. So I was pretty pleased I was going to follow in dad's footsteps. And like most kids with their dads, I thought dad was pretty cool. I thought dad was particularly cool because not only had he been a head chorister, he was also a concert and opera singer. Now, he was really good. He sang alongside the likes of Kirita Kanawa, the Royal Festival Hall and the Albert Hall. So, you know, he was a big cheese in the field of, uh, of opera 
and classical music. And I wanted to be just like him. So I sort of thought it was my birthright, if you like, to be head chorister at Winchester, because, hey, Dad had been head chorister at Litchfield. Surely it's in the genes. It's just in the DNA. It's going to happen. So when the time came for the new head chorister to be appointed, I waited expectantly. And then what I didn't expect happened. So the dean and the head of music and the headmaster and the committee deciding on the new head chorister got their heads together. The announcement was made, and hey, guess what? I wasn't head chorister. I wasn't even deputy head chorister. I was the third chorister. Now, not like an Olympic podium where you have one, two, and three. In the choir, there wasn't a third place. So basically, I was nothing. I was out there. <laughs> so an 11-year-old privileged kid probably doesn't behave terribly well and throws his teddies out of the cot, which is exactly what I did. So I sulked and I moaned and I looked for anybody who'd listen to me and I would complain and get angry and grumpy and pout and do all those sorts of things. Until one morning I woke up and I realized, you know, was I really going to carry on doing this for the rest of the time that I was in this wonderful choir? And I realized I had a choice. I had a choice that I could be bitter or I could be better. And happily, I made the choice to be better. So why is this relevant to followership? Well, it's relevant because when I look back on that, I realize that I had to make the choice to be better around doing three things. And that was to be faithful, to be focused, and to be fearless. Let me explain what I mean. So the head chorister and deputy head chorister were appointed. I had to fall into line. I had to accept that these guys were the right people for the job, not me. They'd been chosen by people older and much wiser than me. So I had to be faithful to that decision. I had to decide I was going to fall in line and do what needed to be done. Second point, I had to be focused. I had to be focused on, as the athletes say, controlling the controllables, doing everything I could to make the best music I could within this amazing choir to enable our leaders to do the job that they were doing. And the final thing, I had to be fearless. And you might think, what's fearless got to do with it? Well, here's the thing. At 11 years old, I kind of thought, this is a disaster. This is the end of my wonderful career as a future global international opera star. Of course it wasn't. It was just a fork in the road. So I had to abandon the fear that I wasn't going to be in the limelight. Like John Hunt, I had to exercise humility. Just go, it's okay, I can do other things. Now, in exercising those three characteristics, which I believe are fundamental to followership, what I did realize I helped to do, I was part of building a choir that became one of the most prominent and successful cathedral choirs in Europe. And I'm very proud of that. So, moving on, I want to talk about what I've discovered over time which is the impact, the importance of followership right now. And there are three reasons I've explored which I find fascinating and quite powerful. So I'd like to share them with you. The first reason comes from the situation that we find ourselves in here and now in New Zealand and around the world. Yes, it's COVID, the word that we're all sick of hearing. But I find it very interesting that in New Zealand, think back to the 26th of March. That's when we all went into lockdown nationally. And the government said to us, we're going to go hard and we're going to go early. Remember those words? And we were called a team of five million. And we're still called a team of five million. But the thing that interests me is, yes, we've got a second wave of it now. Yes, we haven't beaten it. But I am so proud to be here in New Zealand. Having smashed that first wave, Yes, we're still fighting it, but I believe that by choosing to get behind our leaders, whether or not we agree with their political views or not, it doesn't matter. We chose to fall in behind to help ourselves, to help each other, and for me, to demonstrate followership. Now, hey, if that's not having an impact, I don't know what is. My next point comes from the world of the demographic. I have three millennial kids, and I remember... We as parents in my generation, for whatever reason it was, maybe because of our parenting, but 
we tended to say to our kids, you can be anything you want to be. You can do what you want to do. Reach for the stars. The world's your oyster. Just grab it. And I'd probably do the same thing now, but with one significant difference. Now, you'll forgive the generalization, but I do believe from working with a lot of millennials and leaders and managers of millennials in organizations, there is a frustration out there. A frustration that, in many cases, our millennial population, which represents well over half of the workforce globally now, are frustrated. Frustrated because they can't get on fast enough. They reach these glass ceilings. And the fascinating thing to me is that I think we dealt them a bum card. I think as the generation before them, we forgot to tell them that, yes, by all means, reach for the stars. But don't forget, you've got to learn to follow first before you ascend to those heights of leadership that you aspire to. In fact, this is not an old principle by any means. Two and a half thousand years ago, Aristotle said, he said, he who cannot be a great follower cannot be a great leader. So the third reason. This now delves into the area of mental health. And as we know, sadly in New Zealand, it's something we're really wrestling with. We're wrestling with increased cases of depression. Globally, it's, a, it's, it's another form of pandemic, if you like. But the fascinating thing for me is that when I talk to health professionals, when I talk to psychologists that I've worked with, they seem to agree on one thing. And that is that if you have something to follow, something that's bigger than you are, something that gives you a sense of identity, a sense of purpose, a sense of value, that does two things. The first is, and it has been proven, it can really help you from declining into that dreadful state of depression that so many people experience these days. And the second thing is, is if you've succumbed to a mental illness, particularly depression, it can be one of the things that helps you on the road to recovery. So, I took these kind of realizations, took them back into the world of working as an executive coach. And I've worked with, again, leaders at all sorts of levels, lots of different companies, lots of different countries. And one day I sort of stepped back and I thought, you know, there are real themes that come out of so many of the conversations that I have with uh, coaching conversations with executives. And they're talking to me about not so much how do I get the best out of my team? But it's more about, well, I'm really struggling with the relationship I have with my boss, my leader, whatever it may be. How do I get the best out of them? So when I stopped back and I sort of thought about it, I thought, well, actually, these conversations aren't so much about leadership. That was the, that was the brief, if you like, leadership coaching. It was actually more about helping them to understand what it was to be the best follower they could be. In other words, what could they do to help create the conditions for their leaders to do a great job? I've always said that leaders' roles is to create the conditions for their people to do a great job. But I've begun to realize that it's just the same the other way around. So let me finish up with one final story. And we're going to fast forward now from the age of 11 to the age of 21. I was in the British Army and I was based in Germany. Quite dull, to be honest. Not much happened there at the time. So we were pretty excited when we got off our chance to go to Northern Ireland, our first operational tour. And we were tasked with guarding the high security H blocks in the Mays prison. So that sounded pretty exciting. Actually, again, it wasn't terribly exciting. It was kind of like glorified sentry duty. But when we got the chance, a couple of... Um, um, groups of uh, or bricks, as we call them, of soldiers, to go out to a slightly troubled area called Lurgan on an armoured patrol, we thought this was pretty exciting. So myself and a group of the guys headed out in two armoured Land Rovers on patrol, vehicle patrol, and we'd been out of the gates for maybe 10 minutes when the radio burst to life and the voice on the radio said, you need to go to this location now as fast as you can, there's an incident. Now, we didn't know what an incident was, 
But we raced off there with excitement, thinking this could be the moment. This could be the moment where we really make a difference. We do something significant. We got there, and I remember jumping out of the Land Rover, and there were two policemen standing, leaning against a lamppost. They looked pretty laid back, but uh, it transpired they weren't very laid back at all. And I went up and I said, OK, we're here, and I'll do my best Northern Irish accent right now. So the conversation went something like this. You took your time. We've got a problem. It's over there. There's a bomb. So, um, well, I won't say what I really said, but <laughs> the fact was, this was it. This was the moment. We'd all been waiting for the moment to shine, to show all our training, and then something extraordinary happened. I froze. I just, as the athletes again would say, I choked. And I stopped thinking, and I just, just didn't know what to do. It was like I was paralyzed. And it felt like, oh, I don't know, it felt like minutes, but it was probably only, I don't know, 15, 30 seconds. But I remember people just looking at me and staring blankly, kind of thinking, what's the matter with me? And then very quietly, I felt a jab in my ribs. And my number two, Corporal Steve Mead, I will never forget his name, just quietly said to me, he said, come on, sir, you've got this, you know what to do, so come on, let's get on and do it. Now, the good news is that at that moment, everything sort of came back. I remembered what to do. We put in a cordon. We withdrew the residents of the area back to a safe distance. We called in the bomb disposal guys. They took the bomb away. They detonated it at a safe distance. It was a bomb. It went off. It made a big bang. But everybody was safe. We went back to the mess. We had some beers and we all celebrated. But that's not the point. The point was what Corporal Meade did that day. And that is, for me, one of the loveliest examples of followership that I remember. He could have usurped me. He could have shoved me out of the way and said, get out of the way. You know, you're a 21-year-old, wet behind the ears. I'm 30 and I've been doing this stuff for years. He didn't do that. He was faithful. He enabled me to get back on the horse and do what I needed to do. He was focused too. What he did was he was absolutely aware of the fact that he needed to get me back doing what I needed to do in order to help us all through the situation. So he was focused on getting the job done. He wasn't bothered about plaudits or accolades or anything like that. And he was fearless in another way. Yes, he was physically fearless. It was a dangerous situation. But what was interesting was that he wasn't worried about coming up and challenging me. Now, in the military at that sort of time, it normally didn't challenge or call out your senior officer. It just wasn't really the done thing. But he wasn't bothered about that. He came and he fronted up to me and he told me what I needed to do. And I salute him for that. And in that way, he was fearless. And my point is this. If you're going to be faithful, focused and fearless, being fearless as a great follower is not just about not worrying about being in the limelight. It's actually also about being not afraid to challenge your leaders if you think something's wrong. I go back to the phrase I mentioned earlier on. Our job as great followers is to create the conditions for our leaders to do a wonderful job. So, I said I was going to leave you with three questions. And the questions are these. So, if you ask yourself, what can we do now to be or to grow great followers? Second question. What is it or how is it that we measure up when we look at those characteristics of great followers? To what extent can you look in the mirror and say, I think I'm faithful. I think I'm focused. I think I'm fearless, all wrapped up in a beautiful bundle of humility. And the third question is, when things don't go our way, are you going to make the choice to be bitter or are you going to make the choice to be better? So, to wrap up, 
if leadership is the spark, followership is the flame. And I believe we can do every bit as much good in this world right now by being great followers as we can by being great leaders. And I further believe that it's the great followers of today who are going to become the great leaders of tomorrow. Thank you.